Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Jackie Wisnant. She's a scientific illustrator. Uh, in the Department of Entomology here, going for her master's degree. She was born in Madison and went to school at James Madison Memorial High School on the west side of Madison. Then she went to a university called the University of Wisconsin-Madison, <laughs> where she double majored in both art and music. So she has a BFA. And she plays the pedal harp for your performing instrument. Then she went to Cal State in Monterey Bay in California and got a degree in scientific illustration. And she's currently back here in Madison getting a master's degree in entomology. Uh, she also collaborates with the insect ambassadors, with the Huiskin Lab, and with the Wisconsin, in uh, Wisconsin Insect Research Collection. Got all those. Uh, tonight she's going to talk, talk with us about visualizing science. I think it's going to be great to see what she has to share with us. Please joining, join me in welcoming Jackie Wisnant to Winston Antelope. Thank you, Tom. Hello. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate um, that the help in setting up. That is, <laughs> it's gets a little bit stressful, you know. So I'm I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, um, I'm, like you said, I come from a background of art and I'm trying to unite that with entomology to specialize in entomological illustration. Um, and so from that, there are so many facets of the scientific illustration world, uh, which can span the sciences from, you know, physics and chemistry to astronomy. Uh, but my particular angle is from the natural history side of things, so with entomological specimens, but the, the natural world in general. So I want to take you back a little bit through um, where we're coming from um, historically and then where we're going and where we are currently. So what is, <laughs> when you think of scientific illustration, um, usually I, I like to do a little back and forth, but uh, for recording purposes, that's, that's not really a super viable option. So um, some things that people have thrown out during these kind of discussions, what is scientific illustration? It's something that, that illustrates um, a process or can you know, illuminate any, any sort of like microscopic part of scientific inquiry. Um, but in, with all the things that people usually think of and, and throw out there, uh, the main thing that you can distill down from scientific illustration is that it is art that explains science in a visual way. Um, like I said, we're going to talk just quickly. I have so many favorite artists, I just kind of want to pop a few up there for you guys. Um, history of the field, um, what are illustrations specifically good for? Because the number one question you get as an illustrator is, why don't you use a photograph? So we're going to answer that question, or, or at least address it a little bit, and look at some of the, the tools that we use, old and new. Um, and uh, look, look at, again, some of the applications specific to uh, that are adv advantageous to use illustrative practice. So way back, looking um, back into history, uh, the history of scientific illustration, you can go across the world and look at how different cultures are using visual methods to illuminate aspects of, you know, cultural knowledge of plant medicine or exploratory knowledge of what what is out there in the world. Um, so you can, many um, of the medieval herbaria, some of those you can actually identify the plants from these drawings that people were using to document what they knew about the natural world and to pass that on um, as kind of recorded information rather than just passed down orally. Um, so, and so there's a lot also in that kind of more European tradition of Age of Explorer 
going to new places that they as Europeans had not been to and sort of bringing back the knowledge of these new and, and, and interesting places, there was always an, some type of artist associated with the expedition um, if they were doing things properly. <laughs> so you would have somebody go out and either if, there's, if it's a scientific expedition, you would collect specimens and bring them back so that people can learn about what these new plants are from South America, from Africa. Um, and so illustrators, in order to avoid spending too much time, you have to distill your information. So on the far uh, right, <laughs> we have uh, kind of an example of one of those explorer type sketchbooks where you're not going to draw a plant and color all the leaves because you have a limited number of paint, uh, amount of paint and a limited number of pieces of paper. Uh, so you're going to color one leaf, one half of a symmetrical flower, just like everything that you possibly can cram onto one page, you're going to do that and then bring it back to illuminate at your leisure. Um, so, and that, so um, just kind of continuing in the age of explorers vein, um, Edward Wilson, this is a place where photography is, is definitely a thing, um, but when you're going out to document penguins, you, the <laughs> you don't really want to waste plates and have them, um, you know, maybe not, maybe that's not the most efficient use of your limited photographic materials, but Edward Wilson was the, the biologist and the um, medical doctor of this particular expedition, and his drawings of penguins are some of the earliest that the, the world had ever seen of particularly emperor penguins and their nesting habits and rearing habits. Um, so it was a really phenomenal way for um, the artist to, uh, <laughs> to contribute to a scientific um, expedition and exploration. Um, one of my favorites, Maria Sibyl and Marion, was a, 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 an artist working in the 1700s who was quite, quite unusual in that she traveled alone twice to Sud um, Suriname to document the, the insect life and the insect life cycles there. She was one of the, she's called the mother of entomology because she was one of the first to visually document and really categorize the, the, the phenomenon of metamorphosis, where previously people thought, oh, things just spring up from mud, you know, flies arrive from mud, meat will spontaneously generate uh, maggots or whatever, you know. Uh, so being able to raise insects, track them, and uh, prove that, or prove, <laughs> show definitively that there's a sequence where these creatures completely metamorphose into something that looks very different was um, a new, a very new process of that time, a new thing that she was very prolific in both um, visualizing and then documenting. And she published a couple of books on the insects of Sur Suriname. Um, and yeah, it was really a, a huge player in the field there. And you can't talk about scientific illustration without talking about Ernst Haeckel because, uh, or Haeckel. Uh, so he is absolutely one of the most phenomenal paint, uh, uh, illustrators just from history. And book. not only is, are his drawings exquisite, but they are also really scientifically accurate. Um, I just want to take you into the bat image there because it is completely adorable. You can identify to this day, I know, right, <laughs> that these particular bats um, are what he was looking at and what he was documenting with these plates. Um, again, John James Audubon was part, like he drew the bird, his studio drew the background, uh, that kind of thing. So he was uh, really changed the field of ornithological, <laughs> um, just uh, um, of illustrating birds in their habitats or doing things rather than just sitting there flat on a page being like, I'm a bird. You know, it's birds doing, uh, building nests, interacting with their environments. That was something that Audubon's approach changed in the field. Um, and then, of course, our wonderful Beatrix Potter of Peter Rabbit fame was also a, a very accomplished mycological illustrator. So she illustrated mushrooms and um, not only drew like, beautiful pictures of them, but pictures that included features that facilitated their identification. So accuracy of scientific illustration right there on the page. <laughs> um, 
This is just a little bit uh, of the educational scientific illustration materials that are at the UW Zoological Museum in their historical collection. And that's something that um, using, using images to teach, can you imagine just trying to, to physically describe uh, the three kinds of lice, you know, <laughs> body lice, in, in the lower left there? Whereas if you have a, a visual, you can just be like, boom, head lice, crabs, body lice, boom, <laughs> that kind of thing, uh, where you have that picture for, for educational identification. So that, that nagging question, um, it's a good question, and it's one that I enjoy answering over and over, <laughs> um, is why do you not use a photograph for, um, or, or you know, why can't you just use a photograph is usually how it's phrased. Um, and photographs are great. I will, I'm not knocking photographs in any way. They are really, really great for getting you know, precise information and detail, um, especially with all the many imaging techniques. It's fascinating and, and incredibly wonderful. But specifically, what illustrations might be good for uh, in lieu of a photograph would be something where you get immediate, um, immediate, quick, get right to the point, this is the thing that we're talking about, go. Um, so a thing, a photograph, again, is wonderful and fantastic and full of information. So full of information sometimes that it just gets really overwhelming when you need to be looking at um, entomological stuff just keeps, you were going right here, you need to count the, the hairs on a fly's uh, little back, you know, <laughs> which is part of, you know, how you identify down to family, genus, and sometimes species. You, you count the positioning of the hairs, which is great, but if you have so many other little CD and little, like, illuminations or um, shines or something that's physically kind of getting in the way of what you need to see, having a, just a diagram showing, okay, there's four, two of them are smaller, this is that particular family. Um, something where you can just distill it down to what you need to see, what, what exactly information you're actually trying to focus on. Um, views that photographs cannot capture would be something that's either incredibly huge, like a cross section of a volcano, or, um, or a planet. <laughs> so not something you can really capture on film. But, um, and also you know, cross sections in general, you can split a flower in half and kind of you know scan it, um, and that that actually sometimes works pretty well. Uh, but if you want to really distill out, okay, this many anthers per side of this bilaterally symmetric flower, um, making making things just again as really clear and concise and easy to see and distill as possible, um, depending on your application, of course. Um, and then one thing that is not often brought up is that the camera angle with its fisheye lens, I, again, depending on what kind of camera you're using, will potentially distort what you're photographing. And this was actually a big problem for paleontologists in the mid-1900s, where they were taking pictures of, of these reconstructed dinosaurs and making assumptions on how they walk. But since the photographs were taken obliquely, they're getting a different look at, how, at what the bones were like. So this is just a quick taking a photograph of a perfect square from a slight angle. You get not a perfect square anymore. There's distortion. There's change. There's some, so that you have to either be really very careful about how you're taking your photograph or combine it with um, imagery that can you know, adjust for that sort of uh, change. So we're going to cycle through a few examples of some of the illustration strong or the strengths of illustration um, so taking an interior view or a cutaway so you have a lovely fanged deer these are super cool there's a related species over in the Racine Zoo of all <laughs> like I had no idea um, but so yes water deer have these crazy fangs they actually move when uh, in different scenarios that the deer might encounter, whether it's relaxed and they needs to graze, you know, you kind of move them back, you kind of pull these teeth back in their sockets so it can graze and not just, you know, have fangs scraping through the mud. So if we're looking at that, <clears throat> you can actually see deep in, into the socket um, and combine that again so you can see a living animal 
and the, the skull inside, you know, kind of thing like that. Um, again, going to very large scale cutaway views, this is a friend of mine, Phil Krasminski, who does amazing space stuff, <laughs> um, where he's looking at one of the moons uh, and the, the layering and stratification of that particular planetary body, which is something, again, that you need um, to visualize as kind of a, just a more artistic rendering, but an informed artistic rendering. Um, looking at things that uh, you cannot necessarily be guaranteed to carefully shave away the layers of dirt, see inside a nesting bee's burrow, and watch it being parasitized by a velvet ant. You know, <laughs> it's not something that you're, you have to, I mean, you're going to have to quest for ages and ages to find that perfect view. But if you kind of know what they're doing and put those two together, you can recreate a species interaction that, um, that will show what you're trying to do or, or trying to communicate um, just as effectively. Um, so this is a couple different things. We have, uh, oops, this one's not species interactions, but it is compressing a, um, that sort of looking at um, the ecdysis when an insect is emerging from its exoskeleton to become a slightly larger nymph or when it's going through metamorphosis as this one is to um, transition from a nymph to an adult um, insect. In this case, uh, one of the true bugs. Um, again, we, we have a, <laughs> a view, cutaway the insect in its habitat. We have species interactions happening with parasitizing little wasps, parasitizing this lovely uh, tomato hornworm. <laughs> and we're also compressing a timeline. So this is a multi-stage parasitism sequence where you have the, the top larger wasp par laying its eggs inside the caterpillar, um, which you know, would eventually develop into the puffy cocoons that are growing out of it. And then, in a, in a future, you know, a few weeks later, what you would see is within that circle, the tiny little hyperparasitoid, the secondary parasitoid, would be laying its own eggs inside the cocoons to take advantage of that food source. Uh, so you've got a double interaction happening, just compress that couple of weeks down into one moment uh, to better communicate what you're trying to look at. Um, for illustrating, you can also exaggerate behaviors depending on your audience. You can kind of cartoonify things down to be a little bit clearer about like the range of weevils. Maybe it's too cold for them. Maybe they're, you know, if they're really strong, you're never gonna catch that on camera. So <laughs> that's just something that you can use as well. <laughs> um, there, for, for compressing timelines, you can also have that sort of how-to step-by-step comic approach. And this was done for the wonderful Houston Lab last year, um, but showing kind of how to, um, a step-by-step -step approach for particular viewing processes. Um, you can also compress, again, pressing the timeline to show life cycles. And this is near and dear to any entomologist's heart because <laughs> there's, and, and I apologize for all the entomology stuff, that's kind of like, my thing. <laughs> so we have um, looking at you know the transition from an egg to a larva to a pupa to an adult. Um, depending on the type of insect, you're going to see different changes. You're going to see different behaviors. You can get that all right on one page for your educational purposes. Pulling in Phil's help again. <laughs> this was the wonderful cover of a um, of I can't remember which magazine it was, but it was a cover, featured cover illustration showing an extinct relative of the Tinamou bird um, during one of the last mass extinctions, which is, it's both an adorable photograph and a, and a tragic scenario of this poor little bird going, ah, and running away from its inevitable doom. <laughs> um, so things also that are particularly helpful for scientific illustration would be taking, um, well, with butterfly wings, it's pretty easy to take pictures of them and kind of cut that out. But the cutting out of a photograph is in itself an illustrative process because you're making executive decisions on what to include. But uh, to get a very clear sort of, does it have this type of wing, this type of wing? If you're narrowing it down, you can have that in 
a more distilled kind of clear style. Um, for field, and that's very common for multiple field guides. Here we have insect repelling plants and uh, other deer with fangs. There might be a little bit of a theme here. Uh, so things like that where you can actually compare species side by side. You're never going to stage that as a photograph, but you can see size comparison all as one um, in you know, just kind of one solidified unit. And there are other, so again, photograph, you get every single detail, you get the insect or whatever you're taking a picture of exactly as it is. Um, where this is actually a great photograph, I love it, but I wanted to, to showcase it because um, it is the smallest beetle, free living beetle in the entire world. Um, it is 0.3 millimeters long. And so taking that from a photograph to a kind of a concept illustration, you have clarification of like what the little leggies are doing, um, kind of even out the antennae, <laughs> and then show it at scale next to a paramecium. Granted, kind of a big paramecium, um, but still 0.3 millimeters long, smaller than a fairly large paramecium, single-celled organism, you have this, this amazing beetle. Um, similarly, again, distilling down what is in a photograph, you have all the background information, you have light glancing off of the scales, you, maybe the, the fish is not turned quite how you need it to be, uh, so you distill it into a, an image that can be used for identification. So working in scientific illustration, there you can do traditional media and digital media or a combination of the two, which ends up being the most effective. Um, and no matter what you're drawing, no matter what your approach, you're generally going to combine both traditional and digital. Now what I, what I really like, I came definitely from a kind of a traditional background um, with rendering in graphite and ink and watercolor. Um, so uh, again, in California, we, were, we worked side by side with digital processes, both from first generation to ultimately cleaning up the image. So graphite, very, very, um, very, very good at, at subtle nuanced detail. Um, so that, that is something you can get really fine kind of gradient um, <coughs> And, and just like really, really soft, um, wonderful line quality, uh, depending on the hardness of the graphite you're using or um, the scale at which you're working. If you work really big and then make it really small, it can be kind of awesome. <laughs> um, for ink, ink is actually, comparing graphite and ink, when you have an original graphite, that can be wonderful. The reason that people use ink and that sort of stippling technique, many tiny dots to show gradients, that is something that was that is pretty important, or it was pretty important for reproduction. Now you can scan in and print a graphite drawing and have it look pretty good, you know. <laughs> but historically, that was not really the case. You would get like 30% washout of any of the subtlety tones, and so you, the, it just wouldn't reproduce very well. And illustration is about reproduction, whether it's in a publication, whether it's in um, a textbook or as a you know a print of, of of what you're drawing in general you need it to be able to reproduce well to shrink well and graphite is not used to not be very good at that because our printers were not awesome um, so when when you're using ink and stippling if you xerox not xerox but you know scan and print but essentially xerox on ink drawing you have stark black against white, those little dots. Many little dots clustered in one area, you have heavy dark color, fewer dots, again, very light color. Um, but that's something where you get all, every single tiny little dot will be reproduced pretty exactly, um, as opposed to getting washed out like a soft graphite gradient would be. Um, there is a compromise between the two. Um, and again, ink. Ink is better for like really precise lines because you're not going to get any smudging. You're not going to get any, um, you can get really, really fine 0 .00, 0 0.05 millimeter kind of pen tips and things to get just tiny, tiny subtle details. Um, but a uh, compromise between the two is something called coquille paper. That is now a very specialized technique that it's essentially like bumpy paper so if you put a pencil over it, it's like taking a, 
if you put a piece of paper over a textured surface and kind of rub there, that's sort of what you're getting. You're getting pickup of texture of the paper itself. So you're getting a bunch of little stipple techniques by just using graphite on this paper. But again, that there's only one producer of coquille paper left in the United States where there used to be like three or four different individual plates where the paper was made. So it's not really, there, the, it's not really um, super necessary for ensuring reproductive success in your, in your more graphite uh, or, or color pencil type drawings. Um, <laughs> Uh, water, a combination of paints, so watercolor, gouache, acrylic paints, those um, are typically used rather than something like oil because oil takes two weeks to dry, and if you're on a deadline, you're not going to sit around for two weeks and just be like, hang on, I can't scan it yet, it's, it'll stick to the, to the surface or whatever. <laughs> so watercolor is quick, but it's also accurate, um, again, depending on how you scale things. Um, so that is a way you can... Well, combining media, getting watercolor plus a little bit of graphite to firm things up, you have a way to get really kind of subtle, detailed um, coloration in your drawings um, and whatever imaging you're, you're looking to do. Again, <laughs> these are very entomological heavy, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, <clears throat> as, so watercolor as opposed to color pencil. Color pencil takes longer but it's also a little bit more resilient. It's more, watercolor will fade over time. So this is more kind of like an archival sort of approach. Um, watercolor will fade if, if in sunlight, if it's kept in, you know, under UV protectant, you'll be fine. But um, color pencil can get a little bolder. You can sometimes um, use kind of a backwards approaching technique to scratch through the color pencil and kind of get down um, like hair, or CD shine details and things like that. Um, so both are equally valid color approaches for scientific illustration, um, but it really falls down to your preference. Um, for, for scaling, when you're working in any, type of, in any type of media, no matter what you do, you want to work a little bit larger, because then when you scale it down, all of a sudden you feel like a total magician because it just looks so, it looks great, you know? <laughs> um, just taking, taking that kind of detail and be like, oh man, you must have used a one hair brush to paint that. <laughs> it's, it's a nice little, nice little trick, but, but it's not a trick because it's a technique. So, <laughs> um, oh, I wanted to quick, talking about removing the background. In any, in any drawing that you do, these, what I've been showing, are mainly spot illustrations. So here's a species here, I want to show it, here it is. Um, so having, just removing, digitally removing the background gives you flexibility in where you're gonna put that. If you wanna put this insect on a dark background, now you don't have a big white box around it. Um, and then if you want to reprint it, you don't have an accidental little smudge off in the corner that's, that's still there in your reproduction. So it just guarantees that you're going to get the best reproductive quality possible for one of your drawings. Um, so some tools that we use from, from the very traditional to um, modern digital, uh, which again, the melding of the two I think finds a, a really happy place where you don't have something that's so digitally and digital slick, kind of like shiny, glossy, uh, I mean, shiny glossy is great if you're doing a shiny glossy thing, but having a bit of a combination of texture uh, and that sort of traditional, um, not grit, but that certain, you know, like a little bit um, of personality in the drawing can be really, really advantageous. Um, so, camera lucida, this is kind of a, a nice new camera lucida setup, um, but that was something that was used way back, there's tons of them in the UW uh, Zoological Museum Historical Instruments Collection. <laughs> the, and they were basically just little cameras that, not cameras, uh, mirrors that take advantage of the optical system of the microscope to project a simultaneous vision down onto the, the paper next to your microscope. So you're looking through the scope and you're seeing what's beside the scope as, or you know, seeing your paper as well. So essentially you're using this as a tracing tool. And the advantage of tracing um, is you're getting the exact dimensions of the thing you are looking at. 
um, so that you don't accidentally make the insect's legs bigger. So uh, when you flip the, the lever on the scope, you're seeing this double image of your hand drawing on, on top of the insect that you're looking at. Um, so that produces you know, an all right image. It's accurate, but it doesn't look great because the, you know, the bug is still kind of dead. And, you know, like, still just kind of in there. Um, but again, what you would use that for, and we'll, we'll show this same insect in a few slides, um, is you'll take those measurements of how far the legs are sticking out and down to reposition and make it look nice. <laughs> um, so another kind of bringing modern imaging technology, there's a, a lovely um, focus stacking system at the WRC, the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection, which is so phenomenal. It's beautiful. Uh, you get these <laughs> um, really, really high resolution uh, stacked images. So you take basically between 10 to 50 stacked images of um, like the very top of the insect is in focus, the next level is in focus, next level, all the way down until the very last little claw is in focus right at the bottom. And then um, the Zarene Stacker software will stack them all together and, and put it, make everything uni unified into one photograph. Um, one thing I just want to point out for here is you do want to buffer the light systems, and I'll show you what happens when you don't. <laughs> so after taking photographs of all of the insects that I am studying, I had to go and retake all the photographs because I didn't look at them too closely. I was just like, I know how to do this. Da -da -da -da. Um, and then the top two images you can see are totally blown out. Um, you don't want... When you have white on an image, any whiteness is, is blowout. So you will have no information in that spot. If the image is a little dark, like the ones on the bottom, that's a little better because you can always kind of brighten it up. The information is still in that image somewhere. But once it's just like zapped, that's, you know, you really can't go back for that. So the detail of this focus stacking image, you have these lovely pentha obliquata um, tetratomid beetles, which are super cute, uh, but they look like they have a little orange spot on them. And with this imaging system, you zoom in and you can see every single little hair, uh, hair, <laughs> my professor would kick me. <laughs> so hair on insects are seedy, they're not hair, they're hair-like structures, hairs are for mammals. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you can see every single one. But you can also see every single little piece of dust and lint and whatever has been landing on the insect for the past 20 years. <laughs> um, so it's like pros and cons. So we'll take that. If you want to maybe make your insect more symmetrical, it has two antennae, obviously. We're bilaterally symmetrical. So it makes it a little easier to kind of flip legs and make them all lined up so it looks like a nice insect. And from there, you can then digitally, just like we did on the camera lucida, you can digitally trace um, insects, for this example, their antennae, um, to get an exact reproduction of what that antenna is so you don't get accidental lengthening of segments. Because when you get down, sometimes when you get down to species level, the ratio of the antennal segments is part of what distinguishes a new species. And so that's kind of cool. You don't want to make that inaccurate. Um, and from there, forgive this, this was a, like a really quick kind of two hour thing, uh, not even. Uh, so you can do a drawing based on the measurements from, um, from your insect. And in a perfect world, you would do, spend a little more time on that drawing than this was. But having that so you have that perfectly um, positioned animal for whatever you need to do. Uh, just quickly, you notice the antenna are a little bit different. We have a male antenna on the left and a female antenna on the right, so you can just split them and make a male and a female side by side without doing too much work. Um, so the digital tools that I use, there are many um, al free alternatives to using Adobe software, um, but as you're, if you're learning those for a professional context, um, <laughs> some, some of the free alternatives can be really kind of obnoxious to use. And, I'm, and I realize that I'm coming at it from somebody who's familiar with the Adobe products. But using Photoshop to manipulate your either 
scanned images or um, remove backgrounds or, or even do digital painting. There, this system has been around for a while. It's been under development from a number of different resources. Um, this is something in, uh, I, taught, I taught a scientific illustration class through the art department last year. And I spent probably more time figuring out the like, free alternatives like GIMP and um, Pixelmator than I did actually teaching the people uh, how to actually use it, how to use it more effectively. I was just like, how does this one even work? Because there's, you know, I should not, okay, <laughs> we'll just drop that subject because it's just like frustrating. But um, uh, so the advantage again of Photoshop is to um, do kind of digital painting and arrangements. The advantage of Illustrator, which is a vector based program, is something where you're going to have really smooth lines if you're doing something a little more kind of mechanically inclined. Um, that's uh, a way that you can have, um, again, really, really, really smooth lines, kind of precise measurements of um, doing infographics and things like that if you want like a really graphic, kind of clear cut um, look. Um, the in oh man, <laughs> I, I, I should have made a giant slide of the advantages of, of incorporating digital tools into your palette. You know, people say, you did it digitally, why isn't that cheating? No, it isn't. Um, the, the digital tool set is just one more addition to what you already have in your arsenal of um, potential ways to approach an illustration. So, um, but the huge advantages are using layers, being able to save, and then pressing undo. <laughs> Control Z is your friend. If you're like, oh no, what have I done? You're just like, Doop. it's gone. <laughs> uh, so, oh man. Um, but you can't like mix too much because if you're drawing and, or painting and you're like, oh no, what have I done? Control Z. <laughs> That's, that gets to be a little bit of a problem. Um, so, um, something that is pretty much essential for working digitally uh, nowadays especially, is using a digital tablet. So it's not like you're mouse drawing, uh, you know, using a mouse and clicking and trying to draw stuff, which you can, and I've seen people do mouse drawings and it's amazing. Um, but it's basically like a, a pencil that you're writing on a digital screen with. So um, the, the advantage of that, again, is getting that sort of hand look or, or a more nuanced uh, approach into your um, into your cleanup work. Um, oh, for Illustrator, that's something we usually think of it as something very graphic and very simple and you know clear. But I just wanted to highlight this particular artist back when Illustrator first came out. This is something that was made entirely with vector and graphics, and so each tiny little speckle on that camera surface is a tiny little outlined um, vector drawing, which is basically like. Um, uh, a digital, or it's like a little equation saying points, 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 arcs between the points. Uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> uh, using gradients and little tiny vectors, this, this amazing artist uh, does, works in photorealistic approaches using Illustrator. Now, that is not what Illustrator is made for. It's just showing what it is capable, capable of. So, um, oops, I needed to... Uh, <laughs> delete that. We already talked about ecological habitat showing something um, in, uh, in interaction with other items in nature. So one just tiny little bit about information design. There are so many different, different ways to approach uh, showing data visually. Uh, and these are some artists who, uh, well, Minar is one of the historical um, forerunners. You know, he's like quoted as the first are you like the first most successful um, illustration, and this is particularly of Napoleon's march, where you're showing number of people, the distance that they traveled, and the route. You can see the numbers of these people and the deserters, and um, and how the the army basically starved off into nothingness. There was illness. There was um, again starvation. Just just a terrible, terrible Napoleonic march that ended in <laughs> a not very successful campaign. But seeing that visually is um, just kind of like a forerunner of info design. Um, so 
ah, I wanted to zoom in on this. So XKCD is a very popular uh, kind of science comic using stick figures, but um, it's stick figures with very interspersed with extremely well researched and amazing infographics, like this one that he made of uh, relative uses of money in different um, just kind of programs uh, and departments of the United States and just of society in general. It's kind of incredible. Um, we're un using units, simply, simple, easy to digest units to create this bigger picture of uh, something that's almost incomprehensible in, in terms of like just masses. Uh, but yeah, so you can have a chart of numbers or you can have a visual thing that just kind of makes that visual impact. When doing types of information design, something you usually say, oh, your bread and butter is charts and graphs. Uh, when you're doing charts and graphs, you want to make sure not to include red and green on the same particular visual, because uh, that is the most common type of color blindness. And you have two lines that look very similar uh, to somebody who does have red green color blindness. It's not really communicating what you're intending to communicate. Um, and then also getting that sort of um, visual directionality. Uh, we, as, um, as our, our particular way of reading is right to left, we're looking at the Minard um, visual, we're reading it right, but then bringing it back down, left to right, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to read. <laughs> we read left to right, we're reading that left to right. You kind of want to have the, the viewer's eye arc around and come and highlight the most important parts first. Um, and that, that is something just to kind of keep in mind when you're directing information around a scientific poster, if you're having kind of color spots and directions. Um, but, or, so there's a way to kind of consolidate numbers into individual units. This was a, kind of a more um, approachable infographic, like for for a younger audience, but also making it kind of visually friendly. You don't want to make things look too kind of gruesome and grisly when you're talking about a more sensitive subject like entomophagy, where that triggers a more kind of visceral, emotional, no-no response in many people. You want to just be like, look, look at this wonderful little cricket. Um, see how much food it's not eating to produce an equivalent amount of protein than uh, a pig or a cow. Um, so that's something kind of getting that visual uh, slice of information to, pr not to prove a point, but to argue a standpoint about why it might be more beneficial to eat things like arthropods, um, which can be uh, very efficiently farmed. Uh, there was a wonderful event just a week, a few days ago. <laughs> yeah, last Saturday, um, about entomophagy and eating insects, um, where they brought uh, people in to talk about that, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> so processes, uh, processes when working with an illustrator, it, you kind of define your project up front. You have a sketch stage, which may last a while, depending on um, you know if you're juggling different thoughts, if you're not quite sure what... Um, what you're looking for, you just kind of want to play around with it a bit. You have sketch, look it over, sketch, look it over. Because you don't want to take something from beginning to end and be like, actually, actually I want something completely else. <laughs> you know? when, and if you do, that's fine. Just, you know, pay for that time. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, everyone is, um, you know, cognizant of that kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, this sequence of events is from an, actually from an app that has recently been released as a, a, in the iPhone version, which is really cool. Uh, it's for identifying butterflies of Yosemite, and they were looking for a little button to have as the, um, the icon, the main icon. Uh, so they were saying, okay, I want some, one of these Yosemite butterfly species. Okay, well, let's kind of do that. Um, they, they liked butterfly on... Um, Al Capitan, thank you. I was like, the, the most famous one that I'm embarrassed that I don't remember, thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so a couple of different options. You do some quick color studies and things, and then rendering and final sort of like 
visualization or you know wrap up of what is going to be a circular icon. <laughs> um, so with that, I just want to say thank you so much to my main professor, Dr. Dan Young, um, the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection curator, Craig Brabant, Brabant for all of his help with imaging, learning how to image, and then also access to the amazing collections. They do tours there sometimes through the, um, the, DNR, uh, the DNR tour series, but you can also contact Craig directly and have a tour of this amazing collection. Um, my wonderful folks at the uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, because um, I would not be here without that particular program. Thank you. Thank you all of you for being here and listening to me. Um, and then especially to Wednesday Night at the Lab for inviting me. Appreciate it. This is very cool. Um, and then thank you as well to my amazing family, some of which are here today. <laughs> thank you for uh, putting up with me and this kind of circuitous, or really meandering sort of journey um, that has brought me here today. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> um, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Fire away. <laughs> yes? It's kind of a strange question. Did you do your shirt? <laughs> so the question was, did I uh, draw my shirt? And in a bit of shameful self-advertising, yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so this, in particular, is uh, a thistle-down velvet ant. And they, this is like not even half of the crazy that they are. Like they, if you look up a picture of thistle down velvet ant or Dazimutilla gloriosa, as they're called, um, it's it's like uh, an ant with an incredibly bad hair day. They're just they're amazing. They're covered in fluff. They're endemic to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and if you see one, don't pick it up because <laughs> they have a very painful sting. They're not really ants. They're a type of wingless wasp. Um, the males have wings, but the females don't, and that's pretty much what you're going to see crawling around. Little cotton balls with legs. They're, they're incredible, but they, they make me laugh. Um, so thank you for asking. <laughs> that's a lot of doctrine? Uh, it's a um, mutilid, so um, a hymenopteran, a member of the bees, wasps, and ant family. So Dazzy Mutilla Gloriosa. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> So I know I didn't touch on barely any of the facets. I, I'm just like from my kind of narrow <laughs> perspective, but yes. So um, with, uh, like, when you take us through this journey of how a scientific illustration evolved, and as, as it evolves, more techniques and more probably technologies can be incorporated in how you usually communicate sort of the information. And um, do you think in the future we'll have to move on to a stage where interaction to the illustration you make will have to be part of it, such as like visual reality, virtual reality, and stuff like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the question was, uh, will, um, as, as our own technology evolves, will the need for not only just digital techniques, but in uh, kind of virtual reality interaction techniques, will, be, will that be a part of visualization in the future? And I think it's a, a part now, uh, almost. Uh, definitely there's, Oh, what is it called? Um, there is, oh no. It's, <laughs> there's a series of cards where if you download an app, you can aim them at the card and you get a 3D model of an insect that you can kind of spin around. You move the card and it spins around on your screen. You can use um, a handheld phone camera device or a, you know, an iPad um, and you can look at the insect visually. This is something that was constructed digitally by um, a digital 3D artist, and you can uh, point at different bits on the card that will activate sound bites that, uh, of what the insect sounds like, or animal. There's other animals too, but I just keep looking at the insects. <laughs> but I think they have, oh, I, I want to call it like BioLib or Bio, I, I have the app, I'm just going to look at it real quick. I probably, oh, nope, <laughs> my phone's off <laughs> because it's supposed to be, um, uh, yeah. It's. Mm. Go ahead. 
<laughs> well, I'm looking it up. Uh, other questions? <laughs> uh, but yes, in, in general, I think uh, having interactive elements to like either online, um, online or downloadable content, I think that is always very engaging and, and visual and can definitely be a part of the future. Yes? Do you still have your exhibit going out at the uh, Arboretum? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah. So an artist named Alex Lucas and I, she's an artist from Chicago, we collaborated on a um, a display of pairing insects and their juvenile counterparts, because we all know what, well, <laughs> so, hmm. okay, like whirligig beetles, uh, the little dudes that um, swirl around on the, the surface of, uh, of, the, of ponds. Uh, we, know, we know what those look like as adults, but their, their larvae, their immature stages, are really not encountered very much at all. Uh, so we, um, wanted to bring these larvae and immature and juvenile insects into the spotlight where um, they get kind of an equal opportunity with their adult counterparts. So we have um, things like scarab beetles um, and um, diving beetles and um, gyrinids, the little whirligig beetles and um, woolly bears. <laughs> that, that's actually an opposite one. Nobody knows what an adult woolly bear looks like. It's just, sort of a normal looking kind of orange moth, but the, the wonderful little caterpillar with the black and the orange stripes, that's something um, that, that we brought together and, and highlighted for that particular show. So that is in the Arboretum Visitor Center Gallery, um, which will be up until this Friday. So <laughs> thanks for asking. <laughs> so, good excuse to visit the Arboretum and walk around. There's beautiful trails out there, and it's starting to get green. So <laughs> yes. It seems like now more than ever, um, there are so many different fields that are using illustration and leading to innovation. So For whether sure. it be making films to, um, uh, to uh, textbook production, uh, to general art and beyond, how do you try to keep up with all of the developing techniques? That's a really great question. Uh, the question is how do you keep up with the developing, uh, developing and changing techniques um, in all of the various fields of scientific visualization. Um, and a good part of that is specialize. Uh, if you're really good, well, <laughs> I say this as kind of a jack of all trades, where it's like, you know, I want to my, keep my fingers in as many pies as possible because it's all just really exciting and wonderful. Um, but I have friends from the California program that she, or a couple of them, are specializing in animation and. Um, uh, actually, she's, she's working at NASA in their visualization lab right now. <laughs> so uh, she chose that sort of technique to hone in on and really specialize in um, as far as animating and doing moving visuals, uh, which is really cool. But um, so picking, like you can't, you, I mean, I'm sure there's a, <laughs> a Leonardo da Vinci of the scientific illustration world today out there who is really good at all the things. But if you want to get into virtual reality and um, three-dimensional modeling, you're kind of honing your, your craft in those areas. But everything else that you learn will always feed into what you do, no matter what specialization you kind of go into, for sure. Um, so just any of that sort of rendering technique will inform your digital rendering technique, will inform your animating, moving um, kind of thing. That's a really good question. There's in the back. Yes. Yeah, developing an infographic seems like a really intense challenge. Do people specialize in that in particular, or is it something that all scientific illustrators dabble in when the project arises? Yeah, really good question. Um, the question was, are infographics, uh, infographics seem really challenging, and is that something that is a specialty, or should everyone kind of be able to, to dip into that? Uh, and that is something, I think, visualizing quantitative information to quote Edward Tufte's book of the same name, <laughs> um, is I think a really, really valuable skill, no matter what field you're in. And I think that should definitely be an effort, like every, every illustrator and scientist should make an effort, because um, you don't have to be an illustrator to do this kind of stuff. You know, this is, everyone should be empowered to visualize their information as they see fit. Um, um, 
which can make for a, you know, like a, a better collaboration with your particular illustrator friend. <laughs> but yeah, that it is definitely a challenge. And there are some folks who are really, really good at kind of, of, of finding that sort of balance between information, data, um, how to best communicate that. And other, others of us, you know, work through it a little bit more and have some trials and be like, man, that doesn't really work, you know? So it's good to try as many things as possible and, and keep uh, informed, for sure. Yes? I wonder if you've encountered any language or cultural challenges in your illustrations. Um, so the question was, do, have I personally encountered language or cultural challenges in my illustrations? Um, there was a potential project that someone wanted to do out in California of how a, a particular species of weevil was being used in biocontrol in both South America and Africa as um, control of a particular invasive type of water plant, um, the, the hyacinth, I believe it was. Um, and that was something where I actually encouraged them to reach out to artists from South America and from Africa to, to make this like a more unified approach and something where um, you could be uh, culturally inclusive in many different ways. And especially because they wanted to make a kid's book out of it, I think having that be a really um, kind of international uh, approach, since it's an international subject, let's bring in international artists to collaborate on this. Um, so I think that's still in the works, but that was, um, was that kind of your question? <laughs> But yeah, that's something you always want to be sensitive um, when either depicting, uh, either if you're doing like an anthropological type thing, if, you want, if you're depicting kind of peoples of, um, of other cultures from the past or the present, you want to be very sensitive and, and just make sure that you're being balanced in your approach no matter what you're doing. So, yeah. Do you work with a series of photographs first before you create Oh, that's a great... And um, if so, do you then go back and look at the real thing? And can you illustrate something you've never really personally seen? That's a really... I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. So the question was, do you use photographs to, uh, to work for or a series of photographs? And then do you compare back? And can you illustrate something you've never seen? Um, so it is very important to use photo reference, but not to replicate the photo. Again, we have photocopiers for that. <laughs> you know, we're, uh, that is, and then that's something if you're just directly copying a photo, you're infringing on the intellectual property of the person who took the photo. So it's not your illustration, you're just recreating something that is there. So using a multitude of photographic references for plants, you want to see both the upper surface of the leaf and the undersurface. You want to be able to see, make sure that your drawing isn't just communicating one person's vision of this organism. Uh, you want to be able to um, yeah, create something original that is accurate to what you're doing. So, for example, with the deer, um, you have a lot of or the, the running deer. There's a bunch of photographs of of deer in various scenarios or whatever. Um, so you make a lot of sketching. Uh, if, if you are doing something to just try and, if you're doing like a direct copy to practice the, um, like the shading or the tonality just to, to focus in on a certain aspect of it, you label it as such. This is a study off of this photograph. So you kind of keep your record, uh, your scientific trail, as it were. Um, but then you would take that information that you learned from the study and apply it to an original drawing. So a lot of times what I'll do, if I want to, um, I don't know, show like a, a cheetah chasing down an impala or something, you make the sketch first. So like, I want it to be coming from the left to the right, and I want it to be kind of curving. So you have your general sketch from your head, and then you hone in on the proportions. Okay, the cheetah's legs need to be a little bit longer, or um, you know, the tail doesn't swoop, isn't quite so long. Uh, so you get your proportion, proportions honed in via a series of reference photos, but again, working from your original sketch first uh, so that you're not, again, just copying something. That's really important. So you can sketch 
sketch something that you've never seen? Have you ever seen oh, a thank you. <laughs> going after an Impala or what, the other way around? Or? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so there's a lot of things that I haven't seen as far as like, um, I was gonna say <laughs> insect juveniles in the, oh, oh, actually, yeah, the, um, uh, uh, the mutilid, the ant, the ant larva that's parasitizing the, um, the bee larva that's kind of hunched around underground. Uh, I've never seen that, and I've found one, exactly one photograph <laughs> of that, and it was a very teeny larva, and I wanted it to be bigger because, you know, <laughs> being able to see it, and also showing kind of closer to an end stage when it's more than just a tiny little, like, speck. Um, that was something I consulted with the curator of the WRC, of like, how does this look? Like, I, here's the bee. We know what bees look like when they're uh, immature and kind of growing as pupa, but... Um, I don't know, like, is this what it would be doing? I don't know. And he actually studies that particular insect. So um, that was something, if you're, if you're doing something you've never seen before, you're not quite sure about, you want to find an expert in that field and verify with them and just kind of have that conversation. Um, similarly, there's um, no, uh, oh, there might be one. Uh, there's the chicks of hornbill um, birds, uh, hornbills, I think they're just called hornbills from Africa who build themselves into a little, they block themselves in with clay so that there's only a little space for the, the incubating bird to, to peek out and get some food from the, parent, from the partner bird. Um, there's not very many images of what one of those birds looks like as a baby, as like a tiny little bird. Um, so you kind of work from similar birds where you have, okay, I know what this one looks like, and then let's maybe just give it a bit longer of a bill and then ask an ornithologist <laughs> you know, if this is something that makes sense. So referencing a, a researcher or, um, but yeah, as far as, and like for poses or something that you've never seen, I'll look up, uh, is it like, like a serval jumping into the air? You look up jumping cats or other photos of jumping servals and practice them and then make your own that looks different from anything of the other ones that you've seen. Um, and you know, again, do your best to make it original as possible. But does that answer your question a little bit yes, better? Thank okay, you. great. Thank you for asking. Yes. How did you get interested in doing this? How did you find your way? Ooh, how did I get interested in scientific illustration and bugs in general? I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's. I think I've always enjoyed drawing. Um, <laughs> there's definitely school notebooks filled with doodles um, <laughs> that maybe I should have been writing instead of drawing. Um, but that's, I think making up creature design, I think was a big important, uh, not important, but like just a, a personal love during art school and then wanting to make those creatures accurate and feel like they could actually exist in the world um, sort of drew me into, okay, I want I want to make creatures, but I want to make them accurate, but I want to make them look good. But animals are so amazing anyway. Why do we even have to make creatures? <laughs> like, oh my God, insects are so great. Like, what even? What? Like, it's just like the stepwise process of investigation is so delightful, uh, no matter what um, field you're in, I think. Um, but for entomology specifically, I was volunteering with a bat count for the DNR, which, uh, if you enjoy bats, go help the DNR do bat counts. It's very, very fun, very relaxing, very important. Um, and somebody there says like, oh, you're going back to school? You want some more science? I took this wonderful class with Dr. Dan Young. It was Entomology 302. You should totally take it. And I did. <laughs> and it was amazing. <laughs> and, and that's sort of like what really solidified, OK, this is what I want to do. Um, and how do I make this a thing? So then I looked into programs and found the, the Monterey Bay one and just charged forward for sure. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Does your illustration and imaging community interact with scientists who are concerned with disappearance of uh, insects and so that they can do if you go and repeatedly investigate particular area for insects, you find you cannot make any more illustrations? 
because the insect population has disappeared. I'm just hypothesizing. For so sure. So you interact with them and sort of the two together kind of project. Right. It what is going to happen to the insect population. Yeah, it's a it's a scary world out there. So the um, the concern over disappearing insects will there be any uh, will visiting areas in the future where these insects have disappeared, um, will that present a problem for creating illustrations of you know, potentially extinct uh, of animals, uh, including insects? Um, yeah, that's definitely, definitely a worry. And that's something that has been reaching the public media uh, and the public eye a little bit more often um, with recent articles like the insect apocalypse and things like that, where um, a set of uh, just museum, basically museum data. That's why natural history collections are so important. You will be able to find those insects if they've gone extinct in natural history collections around the world if they have been indeed found and investigated before they have gone extinct. <laughs> um, but so if, again, if there is a record, a specimen record of the insect before it goes extinct, you can always go to a museum and illustrate it as an example of something that is no longer here. Um, but the, I, I know some of the studies that you're referring to are pretty incredible when um, I think in a set of, um, when you say amateur entomologist, it sounds terrible, but amateur comes from the root of to love, so these people are doing it, and myself included, do it because you love these insects. So um, kind of a a hobbyist group of entomologists who are absolutely wonderful and incredible in Germany took um, consistent data over the past 25 years of setting the same traps, survey traps in the same locations with the same everything for a long period of time and saw the gradual decline of insects in that area, um, not just due to agricultural influences, just uh, because it's been replicated in untouched areas as well. So you're seeing a, just a big decline in insect populations, which is very worrisome. Um, but yeah, it's something that's still being investigated. Definitely um, with increasing world temperatures, that's something that um, where you have insect metabolisms going into overdrive, even just a couple degrees higher. And that just that really messes with the life cycle. But um, having, again, having museum specimens to look at for illustrating those as it is a potential way to retain some of that information, even if they are gone. Did that answer your question? That was very rambly. Thank you. Okay. If not, thank you very much.